we hold these truths to be self-evident. That all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. That among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Of course, those are familiar and famous words from the American Declaration of Independence. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And if you want a summary of what we in the West value the most, well, you probably couldn't do much better than that. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Because if there's one thing that defines Western culture today, that Western people prize above all, well then surely it is this, to be free. Because we believe that the key to life and happiness is found here, in this, in being free. Over the last five years, we have seen scores and scores of migrants crossing the channel to come and live in the UK. Last year, 46,000 refugees made it on small boats across the Strait of Dover. And the reason that people risk their lives on such a dangerous journey is for this very hope. The hope of freedom. The hope of a better life. Because we in the West, above all, want to be free. And yet, looking around, we might still wonder, have we found the life and freedom that we so desire? Have we arrived? Because, of course, there are reasons to doubt that, whether it be the economic crisis, culture wars, fears raised by conspiracy theorists, deep and divisive questions about what it means to be a human being, the ever closer reality of death and loss. Perhaps it doesn't quite feel like we've arrived in Western culture at a place of peace, happiness, life and freedom. And what if there remains a deeper need for life, liberty and the pursuit of happiness? And where do we find it? Where do we find true life and true freedom? That's the question we're thinking about this morning as we come back to our series in John's Gospel. And you may have noticed we didn't read the first section of John chapter 8. And this incident very likely describes something that happened. And it does appear in a number of ancient manuscripts. But it wasn't written in the earliest manuscripts. And therefore, although it may be helpful for Christians, we don't take it as part of scripture. But in today's passage, we return to Jesus at the Feast of Tabernacles in Jerusalem. If you were here last week, you may remember... This feast was one of the three annual feasts where the Jewish people flocked to the capital to celebrate. And at the Feast of Tabernacles, they were celebrating the harvest, anticipating future spiritual blessings, and but also remembering God's faithfulness to Israel back at the time of the Exodus. And at the Feast of Tabernacles, there were two great symbols. Uh, first, water, reminding the people of how God miraculously provided water in the desert. And second, light reminding the people of how God guided Israel through the desert, through a pillar of fire. And what we're going to see today is that as Jesus celebrates this great history with his fellow Jews, he makes the most audacious, striking and glorious claims about himself. Claims that today answer our deep hunger for life and Freedom. Where do we find true life and true freedom? Jesus gives two emphatic answers. Here's the first. He says, if you want to have life, you need to walk in my light. Now, one of the rituals that happened during the feast occurred in an area of the temple called the Court of Women, in this court of four large lamps. And during the festival, the lamps were lit and the people gathered around them. And there they celebrated with dancing and singing whilst holding high their own torches. And so if you were a few miles away and you looked up at the, 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 the mount and you saw the temple, uh, you would see uh, light shining brightly over all of the city. And that image of light was supposed to remind the people of God and his coming salvation. As it says in the Old Testament, the first part of the Bible, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Arise, shine, for your light has come, for the glory of the Lord rises upon you. Nations will come to your light and kings 
the brightness of your dawn. So there was this hope in the Old Testament that just as God had shone physical light at creation, which brought life, well, so too God was going to do it again spiritually. And it's in this context, the festival and the promises, that Jesus stands up and he says, verse 12, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but have the light of life. So here's what Jesus is saying, that the promised light of God is now shining. And it's shining because he has come, because he is the light. A radiant beam from the sun itself. The self-existent, self-giving source of life to the world. See, so what he's claiming is that he is the one who brings to the world true knowledge of God. Isn't that a remarkable thought? We don't need to be in the dark about God because God has made himself known in Jesus Christ, the light of the world. And he's claiming that he is the one who brings to the world spiritual life. And that is life with God, reconciliation, relationship, peace, harmony with our maker. And he's claiming that just as Israel once followed the pillar of fire in the desert at night, if we today want to walk in the light in a world of darkness, we need to follow him. And he says, if you do, you will never walk in darkness, but have the light of life. It's just as John said in the prologue at the start of his gospel, the true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. Jesus says, I am the light of the world. I don't know how you find the autumn, uh, but for me, there's a, a certain sense of foreboding. Because although I like the autumn, it has many joys and delights. I also know that the darkness is coming. And so when I get up in the morning, it's now dark, gloomy, cold. But even in this, I find a silver lining. Because one thing I nevertheless enjoy is the thought, ah, the light is coming and it's coming soon. And the darkness can do nothing about it at all. And that's what Jesus wants us to understand about him. That's how he, want us, he wants us to think. He is the light of the world. The one that brings hope, peace, joy. The one that brings life. And he says, if you want to have life, you need to walk in my light. But you'd have noticed that the response to Jesus is not very positive. The crowd are pretty cynical. They say, how can you really say this? Who are you? to claim to be the light of the world. Now, they seem to understand something of the sheer weight of his claim. They, they can hear that he's not claiming a place in the pantheon of the gurus and gods to be a light amongst other lights. No, he's claiming to be the light of the world, the true light, a radiant beam from the sun itself. And so in response, Jesus explains why it is he can claim to be the light. And the reason is because he is the one who's been sent from the Father. He's from above. He's from heaven. And because he's been sent to be the Savior, he's the only one who can save us from our sins. And God, he says, the Father, is going to make this plain to all. See, many people today think that following Jesus is a little bit like turning on a torch in the middle of the day. Yes, it might help a little, but frankly, you already have all the light you need. But according to Jesus, that is not how it is at all. No, instead, we should think of it more like we're walking at night on a cliff edge in a raging storm. It's dark, the wind is howling, the rain is falling diagonally, dramatically, desperately. We don't know the way back home. We cannot see. And if we take the wrong path, we're going over the edge. And then a beam of light shines and points us to a path leading us to safety. That is how we're to think of Jesus, the one whose light leads to life. He says, verse 18, he has a witness, the father. 
who testifies that Jesus is one of a kind, utterly unique in the history of civilization. He's the son from the father. And he says, verse 24, if you do not believe in me, if you do not believe that I am he, you will indeed die in your sins. So not only is Jesus uniquely from God, he is uniquely needed by us. I don't know if you've ever thought that, that you need Jesus. And the reason is because of our sins. And this is the point. In our sins, we are in the darkness. Sin is darkness. The Bible says that God is light and we've been made by the light to walk in the light. But what's happened is that each of us, we have turned from the light. Now, we may like to think of ourselves in Salisbury in the 21st century as enlightened people, advanced, civilized, respectable. But the Bible says that is not really true at all. Now, the truth is that we are morally, spiritually, socially, personally in the darkness. And that is why the world is in such a mess. The problems are not out there. They are in here. Because in our hearts, left to ourselves, in the quietness of our own company, we are in the darkness. So much so, there's a sense in which we are happily in the darkness, almost in love with the darkness, and afraid of the light. Scared that we might be exposed by the light. Scared of God. And the Bible says the light is coming. It's going to fill the entire world. The glorious light of God is going to shine all over again. And what happens to the darkness when the light shines? It's banished. And that's why Jesus says that if you don't believe I am he, you will die in your sins. You'll be banished from God because your darkness and God is light. And the point is, if we reject his offer of life, then we will die in our sins and face darkness and death. And that is why you and I, we need Jesus. Only he can save us from our sins. Now, how can we know this? Well, he says, verse 27, when you have lifted up the son of man, then you will know that I am he, that I do nothing by my own, but speak just what the father has taught me. So Jesus says there's going to be a moment when the father will stamp his seal of approval on the son, when the world will know what God thinks of Jesus, when it is plain that we ought to think of Jesus in unique categories. He says it'll be the moment when you uh, that is the Jews, but also the Romans, in fact, the whole world, lift up the Son of Man. He's talking about his death, his crucifixion, because at that moment, when you lift him up, well, God is going to lift him up even higher and raise him and exalt him and glorify him. And the point is that the resurrection is proof positive that Jesus has the approval of God, that he's the beloved son, that he's the only saviour the true light of the world. And so Jesus says, if you want to have life, you need to walk in my light. That is the first claim that Jesus makes in John 8. And the question for us is this, do we see that we are in the darkness? Do we see the unique identity of Jesus Christ and do we want life? Will we move towards the light? Or are we afraid of the light? Because if we're going to take that seriously, we need to be convinced that we're actually in the darkness. And there's a problem here. Because the more time you spend in the darkness, well, what happens, the more you acclimatize, the more your eyes get used to being in the dark. And the less you realize you're in the darkness, and the more you forget there is a thing as light. And it just might be that we just can't see it. And 
As if to press this point home, Jesus then uses a new picture for us. Here's the second thing he says. If you want to be free, you need to follow my teaching. Have a look at, down at verse 31. To the Jews who believed him, Jesus said, if you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. So Jesus says to those who claim to be interested in him, look, if you're really going to follow me, here's what you have to do. You have to hold to my teaching. You can't follow me and not do what I say. If you're going to follow me, you have to do what I say. You need to follow my commands. And you need to hold to it, remain in his teaching. You need to do it today, every day, for the rest of your life. And he says, if you do that, here's what will happen. You will know the truth about God, yourself, reality, life, how to live. And he says, the truth will set you free. Because true freedom, according to Jesus, is found in following him. If you went to the market square today in Salisbury and you asked people, what do you think are the benefits of being a Christian? Be surprised if anyone says to you, ah, oh, freedom. <laughs> That's what you get when you're a Christian, freedom. Because to most people, it, it seems like it's the opposite. You lose your freedom if you follow Jesus. So how can you claim to be the path to true freedom? Well, I don't know if you know the children's author, Julia Donaldson. Um, just looking around, seeing any approval or not. Um, if you're a parent, you probably do. She's one of the most, uh, she, she's famous probably for the story, The Gruffalo, about a mouse who took a walk in a deep, dark wood and met this mythical creature, the Gruffalo. Um, my favourite story of hers is a squash and a squeeze. But an old woman who lives in a very small house who gets some sound wisdom from a wise old man. Brilliant. You must read it. But she also wrote a book called The Snail and the Whale. And this story tells the, the story, the tale, of a humpback whale who travels the seas with a snail in its tail. But the problem occurs when the the whale gets washed up on a beach and starts to perish. But the snail, spoiler alert, saves the day. Phew. It manages to raise the alarm by calling a group of children to save the whale. And they get the fire brigade involved. And the whale is finally returned to the sea and the snail to the whale. And all's well at the end of the tale. But what's clear from the story is that the whale needs to be in the ocean. It can only survive and thrive in the ocean because that's where whales are designed to live. And that is very important because we as a culture have been taught to think that freedom means life without restraint. Life on our terms, doing what you want to do. But you know, that is to profoundly miss understand freedom and it is a version of freedom that leads to misery utter misery just think about the untold damage caused by the lies of the sexual revolution that sexual indulgence is good for you that sexual restraint is damaging that marriage is a bore and a burden that happiness is found with sex without limits what has that done it has brought complete misery. Think of the women who suffered at the hands of predatory men who simply put this lie into practice. All they're doing is living out the lie. Think of the men addicted to pornography. Think of single mothers abandoned by their husbands. Think of sex workers enslaved in this miserable industry. Think of the little children sacrificed in the womb Think of teenagers befuddled, completely confused about their basic biological identity which God has given them, all because of lies about freedom. No, life, freedom is not life without restraint. True freedom is living according to your nature. It's being free from what will destroy you and being free to be the people that God has made us to be, to breathe in the life-giving air of God's wisdom, to swim in the sweet waters of God's design, to know 
to love, to trust the God who made us. And Jesus says, look, if you want to be free, you need to follow my teaching because his teaching brings us to God, to reality, and back to ourselves. If you want to be free, you need to follow my teaching. But you may have noticed, if you're following, looking down, that by the response of his, of his listeners, that Jesus has really touched a nerve here. Uh, he's pressed their buttons because sinners do not like being told that they're not free. They say to him, verse 33, we are Abraham's descendants. We've never been slaves of anyone. How can you say we shall be set free? If you know much about um, the Jewish people, it is a bit of an odd response because their story is pretty much one of slavery. But maybe they mean spiritual slavery. Either way, Jesus responds with the most striking answer. Look at 34. Jesus says this, very truly I tell you, everyone who sins is a slave to sin. And this is what we need to pay attention to. This is why we're in the darkness. Because sin binds. Sin enslaves. Sin is slavery. You see, we tend to think we can sin and there are no consequences. We tend to think we can sin and get away with it. We can sin one day and do righteousness another day. We can sin and still be free. Or sin and be more free. But that is a lie. Because sin binds, it blinds, and it enslaves. And in our fallen, sinful nature, we are not free. We are slaves to sin. And every time we sin, we walk further into darkness. So much so that we get to a place where we can't actually look back anymore. Or we are lost, enslaved and trapped. Listen to the lyrics of Jess Glynn's recent song, What Do You Do? She says, I know it's bad for me, but it's what I crave. I'm not proud of it. Wish I could change. I keep falling in and out of the same mistakes because I'm not strong enough to say, Goodbye. You're not good for me. You're not safe. And that's what's tempting me. It's in the chase. You see, we want things that are bad for us. We can't help ourselves. Because by nature, there is a power at work in us, what the Bible calls the flesh or the sinful nature, that wants to have us in its grip. And it has us. And without Jesus, we are in its grip, enslaved to our evil, fallen desires, even as we claim to be free, we're enslaved. We are desperately in need of freedom, freedom from what enslaves us, whether it be pride or pornography or gossip or envy or alcohol or our image or social media or bitterness or career or death or hell itself. We need to be free. In verse 35, Jesus says, a slave has no permanent place in the family, but a son belongs to it forever. And so if the son sets you free, you are free indeed. You see, when Jesus died on the cross, there were two wonderful things that happened. The first is, he paid the penalty for our sin. So that if we trust in him, we're no longer condemned for all the things we have done wrong. Because in Jesus, the punishment has already been paid. All is forgiven. But second, he also broke the power of sin. So that we're no longer enslaved because we now have a new master. And this is the work of the Holy Spirit in the life of the Christian. It is to come and live inside us and empower us to say no to darkness and evil and sin. No, no more, no, more, no longer. Sin is not my master. And so becoming a Christian involves recognizing your need for Jesus, running to him, and experiencing forgiveness, the peace of God. But then being a Christian involves every day saying no to sin and darkness and what will enslave us. And Jesus says, if you want to be free, you need to follow my teaching. But you'll have noticed that Jesus knows that the Jews will not listen to him. 
And in verse 38, he explains their actions as doing what they have heard from the Father. And so we come to the question of belonging. And let me tell you this, if you think Jesus' teaching so far in this chapter is provocative, you haven't seen anything yet. Because what is coming is probably the most provocative teaching you have ever heard. Jesus says, not only are we slaves to sin in our fallen nature, but the reason is because we are children of the devil. Look down at your Bibles. This is what Jesus says. They claim, verse 39, to be children of Abraham, verse 41, to be children of God. And Jesus makes the fairly simple point, this cannot be true, because children act like their parents. Uh, that is, of course, an inescapable reality. If you're a parent, it's a rather painful reality when you see your children imitating your worst habits. But this is Jesus' point. You're not really children of Abraham, and you're not really children of God, because you don't act like Abraham, and you don't act like God. But you know, there is one you act like. Verse 41, you are doing the works of your own father. And he's talking about Satan, the devil. He says, you're trying to kill me. And it was Satan that worked in Cain to kill Abel in Genesis 4 and bring murder into the world. And you're lying about me. And Satan, of course, is the father of lies who lied from the very beginning. And so he says, in fact, there's a deeper reason why you don't believe in me. It's because you don't belong to God. You belong to your father, the devil. And so, this is what we, in our fallen nature, need to be free from. Our sin and the devil. The devil who is at work in those who are disobedient. Now, it's interesting to me that on certain occasions, um, we hear of stories in the media that are so horrific that as a culture, we cannot but use the language of evil. Now just think of the recent Lucy Letby crimes. People were shocked. They were shocked in part because we're naive about human nature. Shocked in part because we're fooled by appearances. Uh, but also because the crimes were utterly evil. Utterly horrific. And at the end of the day, we do have to use that language of good and evil. Because perhaps after all, we do believe somewhere in God and Satan. But where does the evil reside? The Bible explains not just out there, but in every single human heart, there is an evil at work in us. And that is what we need to be set free from. Because the ultimate end of darkness, sin, slavery, Satan is death. Death is the destination for those in the darkness. It's the natural end. Eternal spiritual death. You and I need Freedom for life and freedom from death. And Jesus says, verse 51, whoever obeys my word will never see death. And as we come to a close, this is what Jesus offers. Life with God. Life in the light. Life beyond the grave. Life in the age to come. And as he talks with his listeners about their great ancestor, Abraham. He explains this has always been God's plan to bring about abundant life, to reverse all that has gone wrong and bring life and light. And he says, even Abraham, your ancestor, years ago, he knew something of this glorious salvation that was to come. He says, verse 56, Abraham rejoiced at the thought of seeing my day. He saw it and was glad. Now they misunderstand him, thinking that he claimed to see Abraham. But he says, verse 58, Truly I tell you, before Abraham was born, I am. And so Jesus explains that he is the pre-existent Lord of life. He was there in the beginning. He's the one who has life in himself. And therefore he's the one who can give life life. But you'll notice that as we close, as it closes, uh, they want to stone him. They recognize rightly that he's claiming to be God and they will not have any of it. And so we see the opposition rising. They want him dead. They don't want to hear the truth and they don't want to have life. And it's as if 
John is saying to us, what are you going to do with Jesus Christ? The temptation for us today is to stay in the dark. It is to choose darkness over light, slavery over freedom, death over life, lies over truth. But John is writing as if to plead with us, look, where are you going to find true life and true freedom? We need Jesus Christ. If you want to have life, you need to walk in my light. If you want to be free, you need to follow my teaching. Let me pray. Father God, we pray for your deep help today as we hear truths which are hard to hear, truths which are painful for proud people. Father, please help us to see the situation we find ourselves in and please help us to see the goodness and the kindness and the mercy of Jesus in his invitation to come and find life and freedom. Help us not to be afraid, but to seek him and in him to know your approval, your love, your grace, that we might be those who have life in him. We ask in Jesus' name.